The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, a groundbreaking study into DNA, and it's one that could affect the way we live and the lives of generations to come. I feel like we've made a contribution to science that will be there literally forever. Plus, a devout Muslim forced into a marriage she didn't want. I was suddenly married to someone that I didn't really know. Now find out how she escaped. And... You fight tooth and nail, keep the terrorist at bay. Meet a soldier who was in the center of an IED explosion and survived. Life goes on and I have the ability to still live. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. You know, the Bible says that you, you'll be blessed to the second, third, and fourth generations. Uh, is that literally true? Well, we've got scientists saying, yes, you can affect your third and fourth generation of the way you live. But before I get into that, I want to tell you that I personally am concerned about the thousands of American jobs that are getting lost because of the trade war that our president is getting us in. I am a fan of the president. I am a supporter of the president. But I, I just think that this is reckless. I don't think it's being carefully thought out. And I think he's got a couple of uh, hawks in his uh, team that are egging him on. But uh, we're talking about all the way from ginseng production in a small county in, in uh, Wisconsin to uh, soybeans to uh, steel to footlockers to uh, Harley Davidsons, etc. And thousands of American jobs are now being lost because of this, what seems to be reckless uh, trade policy. Now, it may be the art of the deal. You got to be tough. You're bluffing and so forth. But all I know is that the stock market is, is roiling up and down. We don't know what, which way the market is going to go. And Americans are concerned. I mean, those at least who are involved in, in, in enterprise are concerned. And the Republicans ought to be concerned because if this keeps up, they're going to lose a lot at the election if they have to run on a pro-high trade, uh, high tariff trade war policy. And I don't think the American people want that. Well, switch gears a little bit now. You may not realize, uh, but if you uh, watch the mainstream media. But the biggest immigration crisis is uh, not happening across the U.S. border with Mexico. Across the Atlantic, more than one million Muslim immigrants have entered Europe and it's creating a political earthquake. Here's Wendy. That's right, Pat. The European Union basically has an open borders immigration policy, and it's one that was designed by German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Now the German people are pushing back. And as Dale Hurd reports, half of them want her to resign. Almost half of Germans now want Chancellor Angela Merkel to resign. Her coalition government could collapse if she doesn't get the right EU agreement restricting the number of migrants entering Germany. President Trump tweeted that the people of Germany are turning against their leadership over migration. Trump was mocked for also tweeting that Germany's crime rate is up, although official figures show it's at a 30-year low. But violent crime in Germany is up, and it's because of migrants. 1,000 Europeans have now been injured or killed in terrorist attacks involving migrants since 2014. And Germany has been targeted with terror plots more than any other European nation, by a wide margin. The rebellion against the European Union's migrant policy has now spread to Italy. Italy's new interior minister says, if someone in Europe thinks that Italy should continue to be a landing point and a refugee camp, they are mistaken. Four of the immigration rebels, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary and Poland, refused to participate in the EU summit on migration. The rebellion has also spread to the grassroots in Sweden, where one poll shows the anti-immigration Sweden Democrats with a clear lead heading towards September elections, with some asking if Sweden is about to have its Trump moment. Sweden's refugee policy has imported crime, terrorism, and a lot of refugees that experts say are uneducated and unemployable. Swedish security expert Magnus Norell. If you live in Stockholm, uh, in, in certain areas of Stockholm, you, you never see this. You don't have to see this. 
Uh, but in smaller communities, in smaller cities, you can't avoid it. And that there is where the change will come. And change is coming to a number of nations in Europe. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, it looks like um, the Europe is following the Trump lead instead of the other way around. Congratulations. Well, here at home, the Trump administration is still working on the situation involving immigrant families at the Mexican border. John Jessup has more on that story. That's right, Pat. Immigration policy. Customs and Border Protection officials saying President Trump's order last week to stop splitting families at the border required a temporary halt to prosecuting parents and guardians unless they had a criminal history. This while Trump continues to call for immediate deportation, adding that immigrants who cross the border illegally don't deserve due process. The Trump administration is asking Congress for a permanent solution as the United States is running out of resources to keep people together. Well, the policy of separating those families has sparked such outrage that it's changed the tone of the public debate. Now lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are calling for a return to civility. Charlene Aaron has that story. Protests against Trump administration policies has turned into public harassment of officials. White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders getting kicked out of a restaurant and protesters outside the home of Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen. Shame! 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 And it's expanding beyond Washington. Protesters shouting, you're a horrible person, basically chased Florida Attorney General and Trump supporter Pam Bondi out of a Tampa movie theater. California Democrat Maxine Waters fanned flames by encouraging confrontation. If you see anybody from that cabinet in a restaurant, in a department store, at a gasoline station, you get out and you create a crowd and you push back on them. President Trump warned Waters, tweeting, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, an extraordinarily low IQ person, be careful what you wish for, Max. Sanders addressed the incident in Monday's press briefing. We are allowed to disagree, but we should be able to do so freely and without fear of harm. And this goes for all people, regardless of politics. Dan Gaynor of the Media Research Center says the left-wing media is partly to blame. If the media did even a vaguely legitimate job, they'd be lined up out the doors of Congress today to go up and confront Democrat officials and say, do you agree with what she said. The issue has also been a problem on the right. In 2007, rocker Ted Nugent called for then Democratic presidential candidates Obama and Clinton be assassinated. But Gaynor says the problem is expanding. We're seeing not just the, the incidents, but the tenor of things has been ratcheted up to the point that the left doesn't want anyone they disagree with to be able to go to a school without confrontation. Democratic leaders strongly disagree with Waters. No one should call for the harassment of political opponents. That's not right. That's not American. Yesterday, a sign of hope. This picture of former presidents Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush reminding us that political rivals can also be friends. In a recent editorial, Republican Senator Orrin Hatch issued a call for civility, saying we all bear the responsibility in some way for the current state of politics and the lack of civility. And because of that, it takes commitment from all of us to fix it. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Thanks, Charlene. Pat, sound words from Senator Hatch. Uh, extremely so. You know, the thing that was so interesting some years ago when uh, I think uh, one of the political campaigns, uh, Hubert Humphrey was running against Nixon, I think it was, and you know, when it was over with, uh, uh, Humphrey calls Nixon and they, they, they were chatting together like buddies. You know, my father was in the United States Senate and uh, he was a Democrat, but uh, they had a prayer meeting with Republicans uh, on Wednesday and they, they met and they read the Bible and they prayed together. And there was this air of civility and the idea of, of, of some congresswoman calling for mobs to come out and attack uh, cabinet members, that was undreamed of. The president of the United States is president of all of us. He is our leader and he, he deserves respect whether you agree with his politics or not. 
the office of the president of the United States is something that should be held in high esteem by every American. And that's the same thing with cabinet officers and others. Uh, we can't have people shouting and mobs driving people out of restaurants and out of the theaters and so forth and crying shame, shame, shame. I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. And uh, the legislators are there and the cabinet officials are there to give us their best services, their, their honest opinions, and they're supposed to work hard for the good of all of us. And if you don't agree with them, well, keep your mouth shut or at least you, you run for office. And if you don't agree with that, get involved in politics in the civil way of doing it, not, not in this mob rule. But if we keep this up, one congressman was quoted as saying, we're on the verge of civil war. We, we could literally wind up with warring factions in the streets shooting each other. We can't have that in, in America. We just can't have it. And uh, I think uh, Chuck Schumer, Schumer was right to, to say that he did not agree with uh, Maxine Waters. I mean, what a horrible thing to say, to encourage mobs to go after cabinet officials. For anybody in Congress to do something like that, that was, should be grounds for impeachment. John? Pat, the Supreme Court decided not to hear the case of a Christian florist who was fined for refusing to provide flowers for a same-sex wedding. Baronelle Stutzman cited her First Amendment rights for refusing service, saying gay marriage violates her biblical beliefs. Her attorneys argue the ruling is a win because the justices told the Washington court to reconsider its decision in light of their recent Masterpiece Cake Shop ruling. In that case, the high court said the public officials can't show bias against people's religious beliefs. Religious freedom advocates say this is not the end of the battle for people of faith who object to serving same-sex weddings, but it is a step in the right direction. Well, markets are wobbly as the trade dispute between the United States, China, and Europe heats up. The Dow fell 328 points, its biggest one-day drop in weeks, as the Trump administration issued a round of fresh threats on Monday to China. CBN's White House correspondent Ben Kennedy has more on the U.S.-China trade relations now on high alert. President Trump is not backing down on China. This round of tariffs targets four times as many goods to the tune of $200 billion. Fears of a trade war builds after President Trump threatens a new 10% tariff on $200 billion of Chinese imports. We're talking about uh, cell phones, we're talking about computers, we're talking about toys, we're talking all about a lot about electric gadgets that we get from uh, China. Trump's move comes after China slapped the U.S. with $50 billion in tariffs, itself a retaliation for previous U.S. tariffs on Chinese goods. Our past leaders should have never allowed China to get to a point where there's a $500 billion trade deficit with the United States. And they're accusing us of not playing by the rules? I mean, come on, what's wrong with that picture? Stephen Moore advised Trump during his campaign when he highlighted free and fair trade. Steve, you worked with Trump on the campaign trail mm -hmm. during that time. He said he planned to be tough on China. That's Do you for see sure. this as a campaign promise kept? Oh, absolutely. China calls this action blackmail and is prepared to up the ante with more retaliatory tariffs. Do you fear this move by President Trump could actually spark a trade war? It could. Yeah, we could see a trade war. I don't want to see one. Donald Trump doesn't want to see one. We have no control over what another country does in retaliation. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross defended Trump's tariffs during a Senate Finance Committee hearing where lawmakers expressed their concerns. I'm increasingly concerned that the tariffs, both those in place and those that have been proposed, are going to hurt American consumers and our domestic businesses, especially in the agricultural sector far more than they're going to persuade the Chinese to change their unfair trade practices. Stephen Moore says odds are good that both sides will meet soon to stop the tariffs. In the meantime, expect more tough talk until they reach a compromise. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Ben. More now on those wildfires raging across the West and prompting massive evacuations. The Pawnee Fire in Northern California has burned 8,200 acres and destroyed 22 homes. The fire is just one of five burning across the state. A red flag warning and wind advisory are in effect for parts of Northern California. Officials say the area could see wind gusts up to 40 miles an hour. Governor Jerry Brown has issued a state of emergency and more than 50 large fires are burning across the country. Pat, those high winds aren't going to help firefighters at all. Well, what they say now is that it's not going to be a fire season. It's going to be a fire year that every year is going to 
be month after month after month. The extreme drought that is hitting the uh, uh, southwest is just a killer. And, uh, of course, Jerry Brown uh, attributes it all to the Trump administration and global warming, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't necessarily think that's the case. But uh, whatever it is, California, we need to pray for it. That, the California economy is enormous, and it plays a huge role in the United States. And to see these fires just burning, 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 um, it, it's a terrible thing. And I, I don't yeah. know what they're going to do about it. I mean, they're, they're plagued by these. You know, every year we report on this, but to have a, an entire year where they're yeah. dealing with it, that's a different story. It's totally different, and uh, it, 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 it will decimate that state after a while, you know. California means hot coast. <laughs> it, it is a hot coast. Oh, that's right. Caliente means hot. Okay, so yeah. California. Makes sense. Okay, what's next? Well, up next, picture a fully programmable machine with functions you can shut on and shut off. Sounds like a computer, right? It's actually the human body. We are, in effect, a programmable computer. That's how we were made. We'll go into the study of epigenetics and reveal how it can shape the future of you and your children. The Bible talks about the sins of the fathers being passed down to the third and fourth generation. Well, as it turns out, medical science backs up this statement. It's called epigenetics. And as Laurie Johnson explains, he can also show us how to break those so-called generational curses. Thanks to these new DNA home test kits, you can learn all about your genes and various health issues just by filling one of these tubes with saliva and sending it to the lab. While those results may reveal a lot, they don't always tell the whole story. Expert Dr. Michael Roizen of the Cleveland Clinic compares epigenetics to a light switch. Our behavior can silence our genes or activate them. And which of your genes are on or not are, to a large degree, your choices by things you do. So, is epigenetics important? Absolutely. Our DNA is made up of genes. Our behavior, such as what we eat, smoke, even think, dispatch markers to the top of our DNA, which tell our genes to turn on or off. So if you're stressed and not managing it, you're going to turn certain genes on that cause inflammation. Even pregnant mothers can affect their baby's genes, such as those that retain fat. If you don't get enough food during pregnancy, your body, the baby's body, if you will, says, hey, I'm going to come out to an environment that's sparse in food, so I'm going to turn on the genes that allow me to save food and be, if you will, very efficient. That means that when you eat food after you're born, you're going to gain a lot more weight. The reverse is also true. Even if a female is unhealthy before pregnancy, she can turn things around for her offspring if she adopts a healthier lifestyle while she's pregnant. The new field of epigenetics began in 2003 here at Duke University. Dr. Randy Jertle proved DNA is not destiny with his landmark agouti mouse study. The mice carried the agouti gene, causing obesity, diabetes, and jaundice. But when Jertle fed pregnant females lots of vitamins, her offspring ended up thin, healthy, and brown. I feel like we've made a contribution to science that will be there literally forever. Dr. Jertle compares epigenetics to programming a computer. The deterministic part in our system is the DNA. That's the stable part. The free will part comes in through the software that tells that deterministic system how to work. We are, in effect, a programmable computer. That's how we were made. And the behavior of both parents can alter their child's gene expression, and sometimes these changes stick. 
you can see that in effect what God, I think, was telling us is that this is the way you're made. And if you mess with this system, you're not going to alter the genome so much, but you're going to alter your programs. And those, since they're not totally erased necessarily from generation to generation as they go through the egg and the sperm, can literally give rise to problems in the next generation, in the following, in the following, out the four and five generations. As epigenetics research proceeds, scientists hope to pinpoint how specific areas of the genome are affected. Still, one thing's for certain, lifestyle choices can bring out the best or worst in our DNA across multiple generations. Wow. Laurie Johnson's with us. Laurie, you know, I went to college once upon a time, years and years ago. Go Yale. Yeah, well, this is what Debbie and I went to Yale, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was Yale Law School. But anyhow, uh, there was something called the Mendelian Law, and it had to do with the fact that uh, your genes are fixed, that the color of the hair, you know, all the stuff you sent down was totally fixed, and you weren't going to change it. And that, that was the, the Mendelian law, mm -hmm. remember? Well, that's not true. All right, well, <laughs> well, it kind of is true. Go on. Well, all right, now, what have you learned as epigenetics? You, you know, are, are we saying that the way you live can actually affect the genetic makeup that is passed generation to generation and that it might go through the third or fourth generation? Yes. All right. Here's the thing. The genes... Our DNA, those are fixed. Okay. You can't change those, but you can turn them on or off. And sometimes totally on or off like a light switch or more like a dimmer switch where you, you activate them or suppress them. And it's our behavior that dictates what our genes do. And so we're talking about things that we eat, All right. things that we do like smoke, things that we think such as childhood trauma. Sometimes these are passed down from generation to generation. They've shown in fruit flies, for example, 14 generations. One of the best studies that demonstrates this is they had um, mice, yeah. rats actually, and they, they loved the smell of fruit. Okay. And then every time they smelled fruit, they would shock them. Uh -huh. So that when they started, then they stopped shocking them. And when they would smell fruit, naturally they'd be afraid uh -huh. and very fearful. Well, they would then breed these rats and their offspring would be afraid when they smelled fruit and then their offspring also. So that fear was transported down from generation to generation. The fear, you, you people, you know, that's what's so weird about this. The fear is passed on. Well, what if somebody is like an ungodly sinner and, you know, is that kind of thing passed on to? All types of things. They did studies, the population studies, where boys between the ages of 9 and 14, when their sperm were being formed, yeah. when they smoked, their offspring had greater incidences of heart disease and other health issues, and then their offspring too. So we know for a fact these things are true. Here's one thing we know for sure, right. is that we are, we are programmed with genes, our DNA, All right. and then our epigenome, our okay. epigenetics, decide whether those genes are turned on or off. Dr. Jertel described yeah. it this way, is uh, your genes are loading the gun, your yeah. epigenes are the trigger, whether or not you pull wow. them or not. And our behavior, the things that we eat and, and uh, the things that we're exposed to, chemicals that we're exposed to, can turn on and off our genes, um, increase them or suppress them. And those are a, one of the main times that we do that is in the first trimester of pregnancy. We saw that with the Agouti Mouse study. Yeah. But also, this happens uh, in a big way after you're born, in your childhood. They did an example where um, these rats, they, had a, they have a gene that helps them manage stress. Right. And their mothers lick them and groom them mm -hmm. in childhood. And uh, those, that gene is, it serves them well in later life. Well, then when they put them with a mother that ignored them and didn't lick them and groom them, then later in life, they did not respond to stress very well. So that gene was suppressed. But well, this is, 
you know, revolutionary, though, isn't it? That what we're saying is it's not just the next generation. I mean, the, the little mouse doesn't get licked or grown, but his genes go th into the next litter of babies and the, the, down the line. It is revolutionary. It's mind-blowing. <laughs> It's so exciting, and yeah. this is the the scientific world is absolutely on fire about this because this was just discovered in about 2003. So now this is absolute fact that the scientific world recognizes this as fact that epigenetic changes are passed down from generation to generation through the sperm yeah. and through the egg cells. Good so grief. in those cells, mm. genes that are turned on and off are passed down to future well, generations. If somebody is a killer, I mean, if, if he abuses his children, then the, the child will, there'll be a child abuser, then the next generation will have that desire, that epigenetic desire. That's the thing that researchers are looking into now is what genes are in the sperm that have been activated epigenetically and what genes are in the egg. So to answer your question, it depends on where those epigenetic changes were made in uh -huh. what cells. So it's the sperm and the egg cells that cause things to be passed down to future generations. All right, well, well last question. If people talk about a generational curse, and that's obviously what, now how do you reverse it? How do you get out of that cycle? That's a great question. Well, that they're looking into, uh, pharmaceutical ways to turn off and turn on epigenetic markers. Mm -hmm. But we do know that our behavior can have a lot to do with that. For example, let's say you have the APOE gene, which is for Alzheimer's. We know Dr. Bredesen came on the show not too long ago and talked about his research that a lot of our behavior can silence even the gene for Alzheimer's. And uh, we talk about diet. And what's really interesting about this, it's things that we all know. Diet, mm -hmm. exercise, exposure to chemical and stress, the things that we think and feel are all things that, that improve our, our genetic makeup. So a merry heart doeth good like medicine, and that's what, that actually affects your genes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And... You really, they, they found that you can't be depressed and joyful at the same time. And um, what causes our epigenetic markers to turn on and turn off are chemical reactions within our body. Mm -hmm. For example, the release of serotonin, yeah. which is a chemical in your brain. And when somebody says something to you like, Pat, you're just really special to me. I pray for you every single day. I probably just gave you a serotonin shot because I mean it from the bottom of my heart. And so that, that chemical reaction is going to have um, epigenetic consequences and do your genes uh, and do well by your genes. That's Whereas true. if you're feeling bad and sad and depressed and nervous, that can affect your epigenetics. Fantastic. So all the things that we do affect our genes. Uh, you having fun. You, we, we've got you on the cutting edge of research. It's really fun. Well, I've been telling everyone I know because this is important for people in their formative years yeah. um, and especially for people who haven't had children yet and for pregnant women especially. Oh, the things that you do. Take a prenatal vitamin at the very least. Um, and then also those formative years right after birth really do set the epigenetic tone for children, so you know, spread the word. And if you're interested in, in this, you know, search epigenetics. There's a, there are great information yeah, online. Another series coming up about the gut floor. Is that coming? Start tomorrow. Actually, we're going to have a story tomorrow about it, and then more in depth reports, which again talks so much. The overall writing theme is the things that we do greatly affect our health. Mm -hmm. So it's been estimated that 80% of disease and other health conditions are caused by things that we do, which is great on one hand because it gives us control, but then on the other hand, we have a lot of responsibility, and our gut health is one of those things. The way the things that we put into our body, particularly our food, but also antibiotics yeah. and other chemicals can really affect uh, our gut health and, and how that expresses in our entire body. I'm looking forward to the series. You are just terrific. I'm so pleased with what you're doing. I, 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 the audience, you know, people aren't hearing this. You know, this is really, this is groundbreaking science.
It really is. And uh, you're very humble because these were your ideas. <laughs> this epigenetic story. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Pat called me on the phone and said, hey, I want you to do a story on epigenetics. Right. So, <laughs> God bless you. Well, we look forward to the next one. This is Laurie Johnson. Ladies and gentlemen, you're hearing it here on the 700 Club, and it may be the only time, but it's real. Exactly what the Bible says. You'll be blessed to the third and fourth generation of them that love me. And that's what God has said. And it's, it's true, scientifically true. Whew. Man, Wendy, what you got next? There's a lot of serotonin going on over there. I want some. All right, guys, that was awesome. Well, still ahead, a young Muslim woman tries to run away from an arranged marriage. We trusted these guys to help us to escape. And they said, oh, well, the taxi's going to come a bit later. In the end, what happened was that they took us back home and literally threw us back into, you know, into the front of the house. This brave lady tells us about the secret plan that helped her leave her old life when we come back. Well, you're watching the 700 Club, and we hope we're bringing you things that you might not see anywhere else, and that you would learn something to make your life richer and fuller and more bountiful. Well, anyhow, I want to introduce you now to Raisha. Raisha wanted to live a Western life. To her, that meant doing such things as playing tennis. But to her parents, that was unacceptable because they were devout Muslims. So they came up with a solution for dealing with their daughter. They were going to ship her off to Pakistan and force her to marry a man she didn't even know. I read the Quran. I read the Bible. I remember reading these books cover to cover. And then one day I just thought, you know what? I need to know. I need to know if Jesus is real. Raisa was born in a religious Shia Muslim family in South London and grew up learning the Islamic faith. I remember um, my mum and dad would have a mullah come into our house and teach us how to read the Quran. I definitely believed in Allah, so I never questioned that, but I never really felt any connection with God. Raisa's family were quite conservative. They wanted her to follow the Islamic faith, but also keep her away from Western culture had a very strict upbringing in the Shia faith. Other than going to school, I didn't really know anyone other than family. In order to obey her parents, Raisa wanted to do everything they asked. However, there was something that she and her younger sister really enjoyed doing. We love tennis and I wanted to enter competitions. And they wouldn't allow that because it was not respectable for a Muslim girl. Raisa's sport was becoming a threat to her parents, so they thought of doing something that Raisa had no idea of. They explained to us that we were getting too Western and they wanted us to experience their culture. Um, and then after that, we um, went to Pakistan and we were sat down one day and my parents said, we have decided that you're not going back to England, that you're going to stay in Pakistan, and we're going to find you suitable husbands. I never, ever thought something like that would happen to me, and it actually made me feel completely alone. I felt like, oh my goodness. They stayed there for several months while Raisa's parents were hunting for their husbands. And then one night, when her parents were asleep. We can't just sit here and wait for our parents to, to marry us off. Raisa and her sister asked the security guards to help them run away, but they didn't know what was coming up next. Well, basically, we trusted these guys um, to help us to escape, and they took us and they said, oh, well, the taxi's gonna come a bit later. Um, so in the meantime, they were trying to get a bit friendly with us, and we were not having any of that. So in the end, what happened was that they took us back home and literally threw us back into, you know, into the front of the house. She had to pay for the mistake she had made. Her parents forced her to marry a man from India and flew back to England after the wedding. 
not knowing that they had made the biggest mistake of their lives. I was suddenly married to someone that I didn't really know. It just turned out that he didn't want to be married to me and he actually wanted to come to England and have, um, have a job. His plan was for me to go back to England and sort out all his paperwork. She flew back to England broken and hurt. There were many questions on her mind. Raisa even questioned her belief in Allah. She didn't do the paperwork for her husband or return to India. She joined the police force in London and moved out of her parents' house. Through my work, I was introduced to this lady called Anna, and she was working with vulnerable young Asian women, and we just connected. We had the same heart and the same vision to, you know, to really try and reach out to them. Anna was a believer, so she tried to share her faith with Raisa. She was a very selfless person, uh, and although I was, I was not a bad person myself, I could see that there was something missing in my life that she had. Raisa was trying to recover from what she had gone through. She didn't have the courage to believe again in anyone. Just because I was so curious, I just said, look, why? What's so special about Jesus? I said, just tell me, why, why do you love Jesus so much? I just thought it's the most crazy thing. She told me who God was. That was so different to what I'd been taught. I, I was taught that Jesus was a prophet and he was like Muhammad. But hearing Anna's explanation of how actually Jesus was God in human form, coming and then giving his life and dying so that we could have a relationship with God, you know, and I thought, well, what if this is true? What if Jesus really is God and I'm believing in Muhammad and Allah and, you know, but what if this is not the truth? So for me then, from that point onwards, I, I was determined to find the truth about God. Who is God? Um, and I just knelt down and, and I just prayed to God and I said, Jesus, if you are real, if you are who you say you are, then I hear your voice, that you're knocking on the door. I open my heart and I want you to come in. Suddenly, the minute I said that, it just felt like I was flooded with love. It was an instant feeling of being washed and accepted, and I knew then that this Jesus is real. Worry and fear and everything was just like washed away. This love that I just felt complete, I knew I had met God, I had met Jesus. The Bible is the final word. It is the word from God. You know, in the Quran, it does say that Jesus is the word of God. Raisa gave her life to Jesus that day and never looked back. She is now married to a godly man named Richard, and they live in Hereford with their three beautiful children. Raisa runs a cookery class and testifies to the love of Jesus with others, especially women who have gone through similar situations in life. Her family never accepted her back after she became a Christian, but Raisa found a new family in Jesus, which is eternal. God is always with me. He'll never leave me or forsake me. And I also believe that he will bring my family together and bring my family to him as well. I do believe that. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus Christ is the eternal word of God. And if some of you right now are searching for something that is real, do what Raisha did. Lord Jesus, if you are, come into my life and reveal yourself to me and I'll serve you. And if you mean that, whoever you are, wherever you are, the Lord will hear and he'll answer. That's what she did. She just said, Lord Jesus, I'm going to submit to you. Show yourself. And Lord, he came and did it. You see, there's a giant universe. And God Almighty inhabits it all. He's in all of it. And he's not way up there in heaven and you're way down there on earth, but he's right with you all the time. His spirit permeates everything. And he's waiting for you. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. Now, she did it. 
And some of you right now, I don't care what kind of faith you've got. You may be Baha'i, you may be a Hindu, you may be a Sikh, you may, you may be a Muslim, you may be a nothing. But God Almighty is there for you if you want peace and joy and love. And what I'll ask you to do is just pray with me and I'll, I'll help you to introduce you to the one who will give you life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, is what Jesus said. Now pray with me right now. Lord Jesus Christ, at this moment, I give you my life. And I ask you, Lord, that you would come into my heart, reveal yourself to me, and from this moment on, I will serve you. Thank you, Lord, that you've heard my prayer, and thank you that you've come into my heart. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, the Lord has heard it, and he'll answer it, and he will do wonderful things for you. I ask you, if you want more, I'd like you to tell one of the counselors on the telephone that you just made this decision. You don't have to give us your name. You don't have to give us your number or nothing. Just call in. It's a toll-free number. It's 1-800. It's toll-free if you're out of the area. It's 700-7000. And there's somebody there on the phone just waiting to hear the good news that you have just received Jesus. If you need further information, call. And we have a little packet called uh, A New Day. If you'd like it, we'll give it to you free. So just call ahead. Okay. 1-800. 707,000. Wendy? Well, still ahead, a warrior whose backpack triggered an IED explosion. I went ahead and told my medic to save the guys that were injured. I didn't think I was going to make it, so I thought that it was a waste of their time and it would all be over soon anyways. See how this soldier not only survived, but learned to thrive and how he's helping other wounded warriors to do the same. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Britain's Prince William is on an historic visit to the Holy Land. It is the first ever official visit to Israel by a member of the royal family. He's meeting Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. The prince will also pay his respects to the millions of Jews who died in the Holocaust at the Yad Vashem Memorial. It is the latest stop in a five-day tour of the Middle East. Earlier this week, he met the Crown Prince of Jordan. Protesters swarmed Iran's capital Monday in the latest uprising against the Islamic regime. Online videos show demonstrators running away from tear gas fired by security forces near Iran's parliament. Meanwhile, other protesters flooded the historic Grand Bazaar, forcing shopkeepers to close their stores. The protests are fueled by anger over Iran's weak economy. Similar uprisings wreaked havoc in the country last December. 25 people died and nearly 5,000 were arrested in those protests. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Travis Mills was just 24 years old when an IED exploded, shattering life as he knew it. Travis never expected to survive his injuries, but he did. He also lived on to help other wounded warriors turn tragedies like this into triumphs. Travis Mills loves serving in the United States Army. Even though it meant extended time away from his wife and six-month-old daughter while deployed in Afghanistan. My wife understood that I enjoyed my job. She understood that I enjoyed the brotherhood of it all. The fact that we went overseas, we're all one. The person next to me would uh, have my back in anything. You go over to protect the guy to your left and right. I mean, your government and your nation say it, you know, tells you to go over, so you do. And you fight tooth and nail to take the Taliban out, help build schools and wells and, and give the population a better life like we have here back in the States and to keep the terrorists at bay. April 10th, 2012, Four days before his 25th birthday, Travis and his unit received a report of enemy activity near their camp. You know, we had reports there was IEDs in the village, which we knew they were there. We watched them at nighttime actually put bombs in the ground. 
but due to the strict rules of engagement, we weren't allowed to go out at nighttime and do anything about it. We weren't allowed to drop mortars or like use our combat strength to, to stop the enemy. But then the next day, you're supposed to go out there and try to find what they did. The next morning, Travis and his team set out with a minesweeper to find the buried IEDs. And nothing alerted them or alarmed them on the minesweeper or what was going on. And, you know, got the all clear. So I said, all right, cool. I put my bag on the ground and my bag hit uh, one of 13 IEDs that were in a row that the minesweeper had went over. His backpack triggered the IED. A massive explosion sent shrapnel ripping through his body, tearing off limbs. Travis was bleeding profusely. His men worked quickly, applying tourniquets in an attempt to save his life. I went ahead and told my medic to save the guys that were injured. I didn't think I was going to make it. I've seen a lot of guys overseas not make it home uh, with a lot less injury from what I thought. So I thought that it was a waste of their time and it would all be over soon anyway, so it's okay. Then it kind of hit me, like I might not see my daughter. Like I might not wake up and see my wife again. He was airlifted to a medical base where teams worked around the clock to keep him alive. When he finally came to on his 25th birthday, he was told the extent of his injuries. Travis had lost all four limbs. You know, and then I got real angry um, and upset and embarrassed. And I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't talk for three hours. I just kind of sat there and, uh, you know, questions run through your head. Am I a bad person? Does God hate me? You know, is this something I did wrong in life? You know, why would this happen? I pay my taxes. You know, how am I going to be a father and a husband? And just all these things go through your, fa through your, through your head. When he arrived back in the States, a family member hung a plaque with a Bible verse in his hospital room. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I said, turn that over, I don't want to read that no more. And my mom just kind of was like, that's not how this works, we're not doing that. And I mean, I couldn't get out of bed and move it, so. Uh, it, it, to be honest, it took a while, to be honest. I mean, I don't want to lie to anybody, because, I mean, you have faith, and yeah, it's, everything's all, all great with it when life's going your way, or, you know, even when you have a bad day, it's nothing like losing your arms and legs, and then trying to still have faith with everything but then after a week or two you realize you switch gears from being down on yourself and angry and upset to okay well my wife's gonna stay and my daughter's sitting here in the bed with me and she's smiling and giggling and she's six months old they're gonna be there so yes you had something tragic happen but your family's still gonna be your family they're gonna stay well then it's determination and grit and it's all about you know what I'm not gonna let this get me down I'm gonna find a way to do everything I want to do Life goes on. You can't be a believer only when things are going great for you and going your way. And I have the ability to still live where a lot of my friends don't. So let's, you know, let's get back on track. With the help of staff at Walter Reed Military Hospital and encouragement from others with similar wounds, Travis tackled his recovery head on. Every day was just, how am I gonna get better so my wife doesn't have to dress me or put food in my mouth? So my daughter can see her dad striving for, a, you know, to be better and thriving in life instead of letting this get him down. And after five weeks, I was able to put my left arm on for the first time and feed myself. And I started dressing myself. And then seven weeks and four days, I put my legs on. So I started walking again. When I learned I could still kayak and I could still do things adaptively like canoe and go downhill mountain biking or snowboarding um, or mono skiing, I thought, well, geez, these are activities I can do with my family if I really want to take them out and do this stuff. Travis turned his renewed passion for life into helping others with similar injuries. Now through the Travis Mills Foundation Retreat Center, he helps wounded veterans overcome physical obstacles and strengthen family bonds through activities and rest. These guys still have a purpose that these uh, men and women that have been through so much, amputation, paralyzation, uh, spinal cord injuries, can still do things with their families instead of live life on the sidelines. They come here, they're comfortable, they build a network, they have someone to lean on, to reach out to, to believe, um, you know, to believe in, to understand they're like them. And the children can know that, you know what, my dad can still do things. And we're just trying to do good here and give back and thank people for their service and let them know that we care about their sacrifice that uh, they made and their families made. His book, Tough As They Come, tells the story of his tragic experience and his determination to keep going. I can't always control my situation. And I couldn't control what happened to me, but I can always control my attitude and my mindset. So with God, I made peace. With uh, everything that goes on, I'm thankful for the opportunity. I know there's a bigger purpose and a bigger calling for me, so I'm just doing the best I can to, to live life to the fullest every day. I still believe that everything happens for a reason. 
Um, he's not done having me spread his message and doing good things in the world. And I'm just thankful to have the abilities that I do today to uh, go out there and walk and drive and, you know, do the things that I do. Travis Mills, you are as tough as they come. And we salute you. We thank you for your service. And we thank you for the inspiration that you are to so many people right now. Wow. It's amazing, man. Isn't it? Amazing. Really amazing story. Yeah, okay. Well, for more information on the Travis Mills Foundation and Retreat Center, you can go to our website at CBN.com. Okay, it is time for your email. We're going to start with this viewer. He says, is it a sin to listen to rock and roll music as long as there is no profanity? I heard a pastor say it's a sin to listen to that music. I'm 71, and I love the oldies and some of the new ones as well, but nothing vulgar. Could you please help me? Am I okay? Uh, I think you're okay. You know, I was uh, hearing something the other day. The truth is the rock and roll started in the Pentecostal churches. I think mostly the black churches. There was a lady who was the really the mother of rock and roll. And Elvis Presley she used to sing the choir, you know, in the Assembly of God yeah, Church. Absolutely. They kicked him out of the choir and said he didn't sing too well. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, anyhow. but uh some of that stuff is just gross. I mean, the lyrics are horrible. I mean, there's some things in there. Of course, it would be a sin to engage in some of the stuff they're talking about. I mean, they're filthy, and, and there's not only having to do with sex, but they have to do with murder and violence. You don't want that, but you say the stuff you're listening to is, you know, the oldies but goodies. Yeah, there's the, the easy rock. Easy listening yeah, rock, I, I <laughs> not the head banging no, I, rock. I don't see that. That's between <laughs> you and the Lord. All right. All right. Here's Marinella. She says, My daughter was in a relationship for four years, and just recently she found him cheating on her. Is it worth it to keep the relationship, or should she let him go? Please advise. Uh, use the term relationship. I presume they're living together, but they're not married. Is that what you're talking about? The guy's cheating, for heaven's sake. <laughs> of course you let him go. Uh, get out. I mean, run as fast as you can to the nearest exit. Right. Just kick him like football. That's right. <laughs> Leave off the key. Or get out the back, Jack. Whatever. Get out. Of course, get out of it. Yeah, especially like if they're not married and yeah. you you can escape, you know, without a lot of uh, drama. Uh, uh, well, there'll be drama. Just but go. Goodbye. Go. It's all over. You have no legal, well, there's certainly no spiritual band that holds you together. We we'll leave you, that's all the time we've got for questions. We leave you with today's power message from Psalm 12. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. Well, for Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thanks for being with us, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.